Hey everybody, John Fenn here, Church Without Walls International, CWOWI.org. And if you're in the EU, we have our EU website, which has my weekly thoughts and newsletters translated into several different languages. That's CWOWI.eu. So we are a house church network. We celebrate the gathering of the saints by meeting in homes and rotating where possible who hosts each week and who leads each week. It's not sermon oriented. It's not a miniature of the auditorium where one person speaks the whole time and everyone just sits there like a baby bird in a bird nest with their mouths open just saying, feed me. No, house church, a biblical house church is participatory in nature, sharing responsibilities of hosting, leading, and uh, it's a whole family event. So visit our website. There's uh, videos, question and answer videos about house church, articles, podcasts, all sorts of things. Um, and sign up for my weekly thoughts, my, which is a weekly teaching that comes out on Fridays U.S. time. Anyway, part two about how to change your mind, how to change your world, and how to get to know the Father. Last week I shared about how, the, the fact that, well, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says that we have to cast down imaginations and thoughts. Imaginations and thoughts, those involve feelings. Uh, that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So what, hap what that means is when you come up against the knowledge of God and your feelings and your thoughts are contrary to that, you pull those contrary thoughts down and you start thinking like God thinks about you. So I shared last week in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, how it says that peace and grace are from God the Father to us and how the Father has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And so... <clears throat> And so what that means is if you feel like you're not blessed, you pull down that thought, that wrong thought, and you say, no, you counter it. You say, no, I have all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And you start thinking like that. And when that thought comes up of, oh, I feel powerless, I feel like I don't have any blessing in my life, I feel like God's against me or God's mad at me or God's not with me, you counter that and you say, no, Ephesians 1, 1 through 3 says, grace and peace are from the Father to me, and he has blessed me with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. You start thinking about yourself as God thinks. You start thinking new Testament realities and make that part of your life. You control your emotions, you control your thoughts, and you make them submit to the knowledge of God as 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says. And Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and 3 say that if we make our bodies a living sacrifice to God so to, because we want to live right, then we also will renew the mind. We will undergo, in the Greek word, metamorphosis a metamorphosis in our thinking as we do that, and then we will be able to walk out to prove out in our life the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So if you want that transformation, there's no other way to it, folks. You can't have the prophet lay hands on you to make it all better. You can't, you can't sit there and pray the devil away. Jesus said, use his name and command the devil to stop attacking you. So you do that in obedience. You can't fast enough. You can't give enough. You can't attend church enough. The only way to change your life that's given in the New Testament is to think like God thinks, to renew the mind so that you can prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. There's no other way around it. It's, it's, it's Christianity 101. You have to do it. So when you feel like you're not saved, you don't feel like God's presence, maybe you sinned and suddenly you feel like the Lord is far from you, you're the one who moved, not him. So repent and you go right back to it and you put your feelings under and say, no, 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 I confess my sin. Therefore, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You know, 1 John 1, 9, you, can, 9, you, control, you control your thoughts and emotions. You make them submit to what God says about you. So we open up today in Ephesians chapter 1 and it says uh, in verse 4 that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, I want to caution you. You think, you think, okay, he's chosen us. And in the translation, in the modern English, and you know, going from Greek to first century Greek to English to other languages, we have here in verses uh, four and five that he chose us and predestined us. And predestined means he knew ahead of time who would and who would not receive salvation. So based on his knowledge, he made a predetermination to go ahead and send Jesus to the cross. And the word chosen in verse four, does not mean, it comes across in modern ears to say, I choose you, but I don't choose you. And that's not what is be being conveyed here at all. And many debates have gone on just by this simple misunderstanding. The same word chosen, and I know this is a little bit of a trail here, but it may help somebody. 
In Ephesians 1, 4, the same word chosen that says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world is used by Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 70, where he says, I have chosen you all, but one of you is a devil, uh, signifying that he uh, chose G uh, Judas as well as part of the disciples. So the word chosen does not mean I choose you, but I don't choose you, but it refers not to the individual, but to the whole work. That is that Jesus chose all 12 disciples, and one of those, yes, was, was Judas, who betrayed him. So it refers to the fact that not that he chose us over somebody else, but that rather he made a choice for all of mankind. And yes, some of them have demons and some of them will end up in hell, but he made the choice to choose to, to, to what we're going to see here, adopt everybody legally uh, through Jesus Christ. Not that everybody's going to take him up on his offer, but he chose everyone uh, in him if they choose. It doesn't, the fact that he chose the 12 plus one of them was Judas who would betray him is not, you understand the difference? It's not that I choose you, but I don't choose you. It's make, he, he made a large choice by send a huge choice, an all encompassing choice to send Jesus so that possibly every single person who would ever live would get saved. He knew ahead of time, he predetermined ahead of time that would not be the case, but it did not prevent him from choosing everybody and choosing to send Jesus. So it's not like in our modern thinking of, I pick you, but I don't pick you, but rather in the same way Jesus chose 12 disciples and one of them was an unbeliever. He chose everyone. What they did with that was on them, not on him, but he chose everyone. So that's a good example if you want to look that up in John chapter 6 and verse 70 to understand this is, a, this is an all-encompassing choice that the Father God made. And my point is, <clears throat> here in Ephesians chapter 1, that he adopted us. Now understand what that says. Adoption is, is by choice, and that is all of mankind. He, Jesus got saved so that potentially everybody could be saved. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And, and he knows that's not going to happen, but he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he knows that's not going to happen, but he still wants it. And he made the choice to save all of mankind if they want it. And so adoption, <clears throat> the point today is that, that if you think that no one loves you, if you think that you don't have the favor of God, you have to counter those thoughts and feelings by saying no. It says right here in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, that the Father God adopted me by using Jesus on the cross. And this is what we have to understand. Adoption refers to a legal process. Okay, a legal process. That's the legality of it. The beauty of God being God is that he, the Father, used Jesus as the adoption, as the means of adoption, the adoption agency, to, to bring us to himself. But once he cleared the legal threshold of Jesus paying for the sin of the world, then then the Father made it so that our spirit man could actually be recreated and we can be born into the kingdom, which is an amazing thing. It doesn't happen in the natural because in, in, in the natural, in the world, if a child is adopted, that is a legal process by which that child becomes part of a, part of a family. But in Christ, you have not only been legally adopted, that, that legal threshold has been, been crossed, has been provided for, but then once you say, yes, I want to be adopted by you, Father, I want to receive the adoption, then he causes us to be born into his family. So that by these two things, the Father God has made our, um, our, our residency in heaven secure in that he legally adopted us by using Jesus as the adoption agency. Then he provided a way that, that our spirit would be recreated so that we could be born into his family and become children of God. That's an amazing thing. And so when we turn to, Ephi uh, to Colossians chapter 1, we have to, again, continually renew our mind. And Colossians chapter 1 says that um, in verse 12, it says, We give thanks to the Father who has made us able to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints. The Father is the one who has made us able to partake in what we should inherit in Christ. So you are able. You say, oh, this is too hard. I can't do this. No, no, no. You have to renew the mind. Ephesians, or excuse me, Colossians 1.12. We give thanks to the Father who has made us able 
to be a partaker of our inheritance. You can do it. All, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 1.13. And also 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that says, Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been provided for you already uh, through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. So if you know the Lord, then you know that everything that pertains to life and everything that pertains to living a godly life has already been provided for you. So that's the Father that has done that. See, when you when you renew when you renew the mind, you think on these things. You think, you think wow, the the Father has is sending me grace and peace from Ephesians one one and two, and in verse three that the Father has blessed me with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, and in verses four and five the Father has adopted me. He chose me. Yes, he chose everyone else, but I'm taking him up on that. Uh, option and he adopted me to himself and then once the legal uh, transaction happened he caused me to be born into his family so that legally it's right and I've been born into the family both those things no devil can come against that no evil thoughts in my own life no doubts no condemnation can come against that because I have both one legally been adopted and number two born into the family I'm, I'm a, a, a part of the royal priesthood I'm a child of God now those two things, no devil can fight against it. It's done legally and it's done in my spirit that I have actually uh, been born again. My spirit has been recreated. So then when you go to Colossians 1.12 and you say the Father has made me able to be a partaker, a participant in the inheritance. See, Jesus died on the cross to put his last will and testament into effect. Then the Father raised him from the dead so that Jesus could become the executor of his own estate. So Jesus died to put the will into effect, and then he rose <clears throat> from the dead <clears throat> Excuse me, to, to oversee his last will and testament to make sure it gets done. What an amazing thing. So then we go down to, we go down to uh, verse 13, and I love this. It says, he has delivered us from the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So that's the father that did that. So all of this happened all at once, and you've got to realize you have been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Satan doesn't have any right on you. You feel you're under a curse, then rebuke it. Rebuke that demon. Say, get off of me in the name of Jesus. Leave. Obey Jesus and just command it. You're, you, that's next week. Can Christians be under a curse? That's next week. But anyway, staying on task here to understand that you have to, you have to pull imaginations and thoughts and feelings down and you say, no, I'm going to start thinking about myself the way the Father God thinks about me. He has translated me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he has made me able to be a partaker of the inheritance that Jesus died to put into effect and then rose from the dead to oversee. And I can receive that. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You start thinking like that and you reject the idea that you're a lowly, you know, God forsaken person in this world because you did some sin or you're afraid you committed the unpardonable sin or something like that. Folks, if you're concerned you can you committed the unpardonable sin, you didn't do it. Because the people who who do it know what they're doing and they know full well. Um, anyway, I'm kind of rambling here, but I want to get the point that the only way you're going to change your life is if you start thinking like God thinks of you. And so that's what you have to do. You, you concentrate there in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and, and Colossians chapter 1. Look at those things that the Father God has done for you and start talking to the Father. Father, thank you for doing that. Thank you for making me a participant, able to participate in my inheritance that you provided for me. Thank you so much that I've been both legally adopted and and vitally, that is, in, in the real sense, in the, in the vital, in the living way, I've also been born again. My spirit has been recreated by your spirit. Just give thanks to the Father and talk to him conversationally. Right now, as I'm recording this, the sun is coming up. I'm looking out on the lake out my office window. There are geese going by, and just internally, I was just going, Father, thank you for a beautiful sunrise. Thank you for that view today. You're allowing me to see that. I just talk to the Father conversationally. You can do the same thing. Just make it a way of life. Just talk to the Father and thank him for everything that he's done for you. All right, new subject next week. Yes, it's going to be about can Christians be under a curse. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.